Thank you, Sir Michael. Uh, now to the applicants, I call Mr. Anderson, please. Uh, members of the court, the story of these applicants expelled from their homes and their property by the Turkish army is familiar to this court from other cases. So strong is their case on the merits that the Turkish memorial barely addresses the merits at all. And the same is true of the address you have heard this morning uh, on behalf of Turkey. The events in question gave rise to a continuing violation of Article 8, where the homes of these applicants were concerned, and of Article 1 of Protocol No. 1 in respect of properties which they owned. Violations which, because they were perpetrated only on Greek Cypriots, infringe Article 14 as well in conjunction with those articles. What the case is chiefly about, and here we agree with Turkey, is admissibility. Whether claims dating back in some cases more than 10 years should be declared inadmissible on the basis of a failure to have recourse to the Immovable Property Commission that was established in 2006. If that remedy is not adequate and effective, then the case will not only be admissible, it will surely follow that there has been a violation of Article 13 as well. These eight cases were selected by the court under the pilot judgment procedure. A large number of others may be affected by the outcome. So the responsibilities of this court are commensurately grave. You must not only be satisfied that the measures adopted would afford genuinely effective redress for these applicants and for all applicants in a similar position. You must also be satisfied that as the words, uh, in the words of uh, Xenidis Arrestis, and as the rule of law requires, the measures adopted are, and I quote, such as to remedy the systemic defect underlying the court's finding of a violation. What is required to remedy a systemic defect? Well, that will depend on the circumstances. In some cases, the systemic problem may be of limited scope, and so is the required remedy. By the time of the relevant judgment in Broniowski, this systemic problem could be described by the court as nothing more than the malfunctioning of domestic legislation. And the introduction of a new law, which operated well in practice, was enough to put it right. In the present case, the systemic defect is altogether more comprehensive. In the Xenidis Arrestis merits decision, this court described it as follows. A widespread problem affecting large numbers of people, namely the unjustified hindrance of respect for home and peaceful enjoyment of possessions as a matter of TRNC policy or practice. Greek Cypriots, in other words, are not allowed home and they are denied the use and enjoyment of their property. How is that defect to be remedied? Well, two things in our submission are required. First, the continuing violation must be brought to an end. In the words of this court in Ersuz and Ozturk, the court must decide whether Turkey has been effective in changing the general situation of which the applicants complain. And secondly, there must be a remedy which secures genuinely effective redress, not only in relation to these applicants, but in relation to all similar applications. Turkey has achieved neither of those essential requirements, and I take them in turn. First, the continuing violation has not been brought to an end. The policy and practice of the TRNC remain firmly opposed to respect for the applicants' homes in the north of the island and to allowing for the peaceful enjoyment of their possessions. So, Turkey, unlike Poland in Broniowski, has never acknowledged responsibility for any past violation of the Convention in northern Cyprus. It continues to resist findings of violation on substantive as well as admissibility grounds in every single case, even in cases such as these 
in which it is not clear what substantive defence there could be. It has not even paid the sums that it has been required by this court to pay to the heirs of Mr. De Madis or to Mrs. Xenidis Arestis, that sum uh, overdue since August of 2007. Turkey continues to make it impossible for Greek Cypriots to settle in the north. A visa is required to cross the ceasefire line and it expires after a maximum of three months. This means that Cypriots can only be present in the occupied area of their own country as temporary visitors. Uh, Mrs. Loisidou, Mrs. Xenidis Arestis and the heirs of Mr. Damadis are all in that position. And the authorities continue to make the situation worse by taking active steps to sell and permit the redevelopment of land, despite the fact that, as this court has been telling them for years, it is not theirs to sell, it is the property of Greek Cypriots. This continues to happen on a large scale, and there are some examples in the memorials. And they're not doing this just for the money. They're doing it in pursuit of a political aspiration for the permanent division of the island on ethnic lines. That policy was expressed by the special representative of the Turkish Cypriot leader, Talat. Uh, you see it in Appendix 9 to the Memorial of Cyprus. As follows, a significant part of the Greek Cypriot properties will pass to the Turkish Cypriots. That is an important criterion for us. By barring any possibility of restitution in the vast majority of cases, the 2005 law has the quite deliberate effect of permanently preventing the return of thousands of people to their homes in the north of the island. Its aim is to facilitate a reallocation of property from Greek Cypriots to Turkish Cypriots. It is an instrument of ethnic discrimination. Far from remedying the systemic defect, it actively reinforces it. Turkey does refer to one case, paragraph 106 of its memorial, in which the authorities agreed to freeze all construction and development of the property until the Cyprus problem is resolved. But the fact that this is mentioned at all demonstrates what is also obvious from the text of the law itself. That is a rare exception to the rule. Other properties are liable to be sold and developed, and they are being sold and developed. Finally, there is Article 1591B of the TRNC Constitution, a provision which this Court has already described as invalid for the purposes of the Convention, but which has not been repealed or amended. Not surprisingly, uh, since its whole, uh, not surprising that it's invalid, since its whole rationale is to vest property in the TRNC, when, as this Court has repeatedly affirmed, that property remains in the ownership of those who had it before the invasion. Turkey suggests, and the suggestion was reinforced this morning, that the problem has been solved uh, by a 2006 judgment of the TRNC uh, Constitutional Court. Uh, we disagree. Two points on that. First, the judgment specifically affirms that Article 159 applies only to Greeks and Greek Cypriots. The discrimination on national or ethnic grounds uh, could hardly be more uh, obvious. That's page 48 uh, of the judgment. But secondly, uh, the Constitutional Court uh, confirms what is equally obvious, uh, that under, under Article 159, uh, the ownership of Greek Cypriot property was transferred to the TRNC. I thought I heard Sir Michael express a different view this morning, so may I read uh, a short passage from page 49 of the judgment. It is possible to read Article 159, says the court, by means of reconciling it with international law rules, such that while the ownership of these properties were transferred to the state in order to show the sovereignty of the TRNC, the right of compensation was also recognized. Well, if that is the uh, constitutional court's idea of what is consistent with international law, we submit that it is not the idea of this court.